Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. It's your host, Mark Snyder. We're doing a show kind of crazy tonight by the seat of our pants. Uh, let me play a little opening music, and then we'll get into things here. back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. I'm going to talk tonight about Contact 141, 142, a little bit about Contact 136 that we've tried to leave and I just can't get away from it. I'm also going to chat a little bit about Frosty Woolridge's book called America on the Brink. And, of course, I'm going to be talking about reincarnation, the universal consciousness, the human spirit, and other various aspects of the contacts of Edward Albert Meyer. And we may have some call-ins as we get into the show a little bit. I think during the second hour we may have um, Kosal call in and I'm hoping I have another mystery caller call in the first hour, but I don't want to mention any names until I get to I know a little better for sure. Anyway, Edward Albert Meyer, he's a one-armed farmer from Switzerland. He's 77 years old now. He lives in a little tiny mountain village called Hinterschmidruti. It's about an hour east of Zurich. And it's a beautiful village I played a clip last weekend about another little village called Gimmewald in Switzerland, which is just, it's so beautiful, it's hard to put into words. These people live very, very close to nature. And I think they have a very unusual perspective, a very special perspective that we could learn very much from. And from what I understand, what I'm gathering based on the Meyer contacts, this closeness to nature, this appreciation for the natural world, for the creation, is 
what many of these extraterrestrial intelligences have in common. Uh, this understanding the interconnectedness of all things. And I've talked about the universal consciousness many, many times on the show before. That it's a neutral positive entity. That it it builds universes as a part of its own evolution. It is a super intelligence, but I really think its consciousness is, is a bit different than humans. Uh, it'd be very difficult for us to get in direct contact with it. I don't think that's even possible. I think we have indirect contact, especially through nature. While I was walking the dogs this evening, there's one particular area where the trees have grown very, very tall and it forms like a canopy. It's hard to describe, but it's almost like being in a rainforest. And you can see the lights coming down through the trees, and you can also see the shallow end of the lake in between the trees. It's very, very beautiful, very, very green. In fact, when Billy talks about the love of creation, he always describes it in terms of nature. For he, for example, he says, the incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation and that creation radiates love. And in the German, there's a word called empfinden, which is a spiritual process that's related to what they call the gemut, which is a part of your spiritual body. It's the part of your spirit body that controls the thoughts and feelings associated to your human spirit. And empfinden is what allows you to perceive the radiating love of creation. So empfinden is this fine, sensitive feeling. It's it's the ability to sense that radiating love that comes from nature itself, from the structure of nature, from the energy associated with nature. In fact, Billy has a writing, it's called Love Letter 27, where it mentions that at every moment, at every place, the human being can experience the radiating love of creation. And that we ought to be able to look at a tree and appreciate the love of creation and the fact that everything follows that love, that principle in absolute logic. You see, love is the highest principle in creation. Nature is the visible expression of the love of the universal consciousness. <clears throat> now here's the what will probably sound weird to many people. And I've been in contact mostly by email with one of the people from Switzerland, Marianne Ulinger, who works right beside Billy, and she's extremely knowledgeable. And in one email she sent me, she said something to the fact that um, the universal consciousness, although it radiates love, it doesn't personally love us. And I think that's worth mentioning because it's much like the sun. The sun radiates light, keeps us alive, not necessarily because it loves us, because that's its nature, to radiate light. And the universal consciousness radiates love as well. Now, after we go through these billions of of years of reincarnation, time in the material, time in the spiritual, eventually we merge back with creation. Because every human spirit is a tiny fragment of the universal consciousness. 
We are created by creation for the purpose of helping it in its own evolution. And the purpose of our life is evolution. The purpose of our life is to gain wisdom. I thought it might be a a good time to play this clip. It's about reincarnation and past, past life evidence. And now, one of the biggest questions of life. What happens when it's over? Heaven? Hell? Nothing? Or might there be a fourth possibility? Reincarnation. Could we come back as someone else? Here's Chris Cuomo with two down-to-earth parents who thought they understood the mysteries of life. That is, until their toddler began to talk. On March 3rd, 1945, a 21-year-old Navy fighter pilot on a mission over the Pacific was shot down by Japanese artillery. His name might well have been forgotten, were it not for the remarkable, some might say unbelievable story of a little boy named James. Okay, this is me, Tom. I need somebody to help me. All right, I'm the volunteer. What do you want me to do? Okay, I just go climb this thing and you have to call me in case I fall. Done. James Leiniger is all boy, six years old, and full of spirit. This is a special plane that goes in reverse. You don't see a lot of that. James knows a lot about planes, especially war planes. What kind of airplane is that? It's a car, sir. His parents, Andrea and Bruce Leiniger, say from an early age, James would play with nothing else. He was obsessed with airplanes. If you look around the house, that's all you'll see. Airplanes, helicopters, aircraft carriers. But then, when he was two, the planes James loved suddenly began to give him frequent and frightening nightmares. I'd wake him up and he'd be screaming and he'd always be laying on his back, kicking his feet up at the ceiling. And I'd say, baby, what were you dreaming about? He'd say, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. They sound like typical kitty nightmares, but Andrea says they went on the same way for months. Maybe too much TV. But James was just two, and his parents say only watching Barney and Teletubbies. Teletubbies! And Andrea and Bruce say they weren't watching World War II documentaries or conversing about military history. This is an F-18? No, that one. So what explains the nightmares and James's strange obsession with airplanes? I talked to my mom about it a lot of times. My mom had said maybe he's remembering a past life. What did you say? Uh, politely? Baloney. Andrea and Bruce of Lafayette, Louisiana, are a highly educated modern couple. To them, the possibility that their little son James was manifesting signs of a former life was, well, a little out there. You know, having a past life is not the initial conclusion that you come to. You try and figure out any other way he could have. Did he see anything? Has there ever been anything on television, anything that we've discussed? But as time went by, Andrea didn't know what to believe. Here is James at age three, going over a plane as if he's doing a pre-flight check. He would continue to say and do things that were puzzling, like the time his mom bought him a toy airplane. And I said, oh, look, there's a bomb on the bottom of it. He said, that's not a bomb, Mama, that's a drop tank. A drop tank? I'd never heard of a drop tank. I didn't know what a drop tank was. Andrea's mother suggested she look into the work of counselor and therapist Carol Bowman. Bowman has written two books, both supporting the proposition that sometimes the dead can be reborn. We are taught from a very early age in this culture, in the Judeo-Christian culture, that reincarnation doesn't exist. Once you observe this in a child, and the evidence is very compelling, you have to open up to another explanation for what is going on. Bruce was deeply skeptical. He said there has to be a logical explanation. I don't believe in past lives. I don't believe in this stuff. But with the violent nightmares recurring three and four times a week, the Leinigers felt they had to do something. So with guidance from Bowman, they cautiously began to encourage James to share his memories. They say the result was startling. The nightmares immediately started reducing in frequency. Uh, He went down from three or four times a week to maybe one a week, one every other week. And at that point was when he started to articulate more about these past life memories. Seems normal enough, a little boy improving when his troubles are directly addressed. But Bowman says this is more than 
James was forthcoming because this is the age when former lives are most easily recalled. They haven't had the cultural conditioning, the layering over of experience in this life so that the memories can percolate up more easily. These memories tend to fade between the ages of five to seven. His parents say between the ages of two and four, James would reveal extraordinary details about the life of a former fighter pilot, mostly at bedtime, when he was drowsy. Bruce said, um, what happened to your plane? He said, it crashed on fire. And Bruce said, why did your airplane crash? And he said, it got shot. And Bruce said, well, who shot your plane? And I'll never forget the look on his face. He went, oh, the Japanese. Still, despite these extraordinary stories, Bruce remained dubious. Almost to prove they couldn't be true, he began to piece together the details James was sharing. And what he found, he says, shook him to the core. For in many instances, the stories appeared to match the facts. James seemed to be recalling real events, real people, in the life of a man who had been dead for almost 60 years. Coming up, a toddler, just three years old. So how does he know the pilots from a World War II squadron? That was like, holy man, you could have poured my brains out of my ears. I just couldn't believe it. When Prime Time continues... With each passing month, little James Leiniger seemed to be peeling back memories of a past life. Ooh, hey. Vivid memories that scared and astonished his parents. Bruce had always said, what kind of plane did you fly? Yeah. He said, a Corsair. Yeah. He uh, said, a Corsair? He said the word Corsair. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not only did James remember flying a Corsair, he demonstrated knowledge of the plane's peculiarities, like the time he was flipping through a book about planes when he was four. And he got to the Corsair, and he said, that's a Corsair. And he goes, you know what, they used to get flat tires all the time. In fact, historians and pilots agree that the plane's tires took a lot of punishment on landing. Of course, this is a fact that could easily be found in books or on TV. But then, James began to offer up the kinds of specific details his parents say are harder to explain away. A another night, Bruce had come in, and he said, do you remember where your plane took off? And he said it took off of a boat. Do you remember the name of your boat? Natoma. Do you remember what your name was? And he'd always say, James. But his name is James. It never it really occurred to him. Such an amazing, amazing story of reincarnation. The story of James Leiniger, the young boy who has clear, clear, vivid memories of being a pilot in World War II, flying a Corsair. <clears throat> He remembered flying off of the aircraft carrier called the Natoma Bay. Later on in this clip, he talks about some of the other officers that he flew with. He mentions them by name. This is one of the most convincing cases in terms of reincarnation and past life memories. This young boy never was regressed or anything. Uh, and he had knowledge that really couldn't be explained away. When you die, your human spirit comes out of your physical body, and it goes into this etheric energy band around our planet called the spirit, the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm resides in the same space, 3D space, as our Earth, but it's a different dimension. And your human spirit goes over there, and the universal consciousness will take your past life memories and store them in something called the storage banks. And you kind of go through this rest phase, um, on, on, on the other side. And then at the appropriate time, your human spirit is placed back into the body of a 21-day-old child. Your human spirit is placed in the embryo 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg. 
Now your spirit form goes into the midbrain of that child in what's called the superior colliculus, and that's the area that controls sight and eye movement. And the energy of your human spirit will move throughout that body of that child like a filigree web, and it animates every cell in that child's body. And that's when the child starts to have consciousness-based evolution. Before that, the embryo was evolving based on impulses. Uh, That's the way plants evolve. And my understanding is that plants also have a spirit form. And they also evolve. And I had the strangest thought one day, again, while walking, the dogs walking in the woods. This was about a month ago, and I saw these tremendous weeds. We got some really tall uh, plant life here, seven, eight feet tall. It's just really bizarre. You have to see it to understand it. And it dawned on me that these spirit forms are just blasting out of the spiritual realm into the physical. So life is an amazing thing. It exists in the physical and in the spiritual, both. And the universal consciousness, the creation, as it's called by the extraterrestrials, has a spiritual aspect as well as a physical aspect. Now, our universe is extremely vast. And our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is also very large. It's about 100,000 light years across. And there exists within our galaxy and within our universe different time planes or different time-space configurations which we could roughly call dimensions, for lack of a better word. Now, our ancestors, the Lyrians and the Pleiaran, resided in a different space-time configuration than we do in the soul system. Now, in Contact 142, which I recently played three or four days ago as an MP3, we hear about a group of extraterrestrials that have visited Earth that are from our time-space configuration. And in line 82, I think it's of Contact 141, It says, for about 40 days, there have been another station of extraterrestrial intelligences on the Earth provided by us to resembling human life forms from the planet Haster in the Garen system of the Janem galaxy. The galaxy is located 483 million light years from the Earth, and 413 different human races live on the inhabitable planets there throughout the entire galaxy, which is relatively seen very little for an entire galaxy. Just a few years ago, we entered into connection with the highly sophisticated inhabitants of the planet Haster, who have progressed so far in their overall development as it would be for the Earth people in approximately 1,120 years. And it goes on to explain, I think, that these extraterrestrials currently have a base. Perhaps it's in the North Sea. Ah, here here it says. We also helped them build their station, which was created in the depths of the North Sea. And from there, they will expand their expeditionary work across the whole world. Since their mental, physical, and consciousness-related development has yet not yet progressed as far as ours, 
We can only maintain physical contact with him using our vibration neutralizing devices, as we must also do with the earth people when it is necessary now and then. However, this now means that the Hastur inhabitants can freely move among the earth people because their vibrations turn out to be bearable with those of the earth people, but only briefly. The Hastur inhabitants cannot remain in the direct range of the vibrations of earth people for more than 17 hours, otherwise they begin to lose control of themselves. And we've talked about that before. One of the reasons that the Pleiaran only have physical contact with Billy is because Billy's spirit form is so ancient. And its vibrations, its auric qualities are more compatible with theirs. The auric vibes of Billy is much, much more compatible to the auric vibes of the Pleiaran. Now, the Pleiaran cannot come within 90 meters of a typical Earth human, or they will have um, uncontrolled, they'll lose control of themselves. So, when the extraterrestrial race is too highly advanced, it's difficult for them to be in our presence. Now, these hasters, as they're called, evidently are a little closer to us in terms of their evolvement. And maybe only uh, 1,120 years more advanced than us. So we can interact with them to a certain degree, as it said in that contact case. Now, even Semyase was injured, in fact, when she fell when one of the people in the Figo actually came in the room during a contact that she had with Billy. And I think the guy's name is Jacobus, but I, I wouldn't swear to that. But there are other, there's another extraterrestrial group here on the Earth called the Hyperboreans. And the Hyperboreans have a small city within Mount Shasta of about 700 people, the Hyperboreans came to the Earth about 180,000, 190,000 years ago. They are a blonde people. Uh, sometimes their spherical spacecrafts can be seen exiting the eastern side of Mount Shasta, and also extraterrestrials visit them as well. When nearby humans come too close, Sometimes they will neutralize them with these beam weapons, just to kind of stun them. So they, they generally don't interact with with Earth humans so much as well. The Hyperboreans have some connection with um, Noah Kad Nasser, <clears throat> who was the actual person that was involved with the Ark and the Flood the real name of Noah, according to the Meyer material, is Noah Kadnasser. And I think there was a king of wisdom related to these Hyperboreans that helped him during the building of the Ark. Anyway, lots of information in the Meyer material. We were talking about reincarnation and how that whole process works. And I think what I'll do is on the flip side here, I'll play a little I'll play a little music right now and then we'll be back in about a, a we'll be back in about a minute or two and I'll pick back up and talk a little bit more about reincarnation and then Kosal will join us at about 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back.
everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Before the break, we were talking about how the human spirit reincarnates into the physical body of a child 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg. Now, there's this thing, for lack of a better word, that the Meyer material calls the comprehensive consciousness block, which plays a role during reincarnation. And it makes sure that we get a new personality each reincarnation. It also, my belief is, it plays a role in placing the wisdom of our predecessor personalities into our subconscious. So what happens is, when the spirit comes into the body of the child, into the superior colliculus, animates every aspect of the child's body, the embryo's child, will get a new material consciousness, and the wisdom of our predecessor personalities is placed in our subconscious. Now as that child grows back up, It has to grow up like any other child would. But it will have an advantage this lifetime that it didn't have last time. And that is it will have inspiration from the wisdom of its last lifetime will come up from its predecessor personality, personalities, and it will also receive impulses from the storage bank. And that's the way wisdom grows on top of wisdom in each lifetime. Now, Edward Albert Meyer, according to the Meyer material, has had at least seven incarnations here on the earth. He has been Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. And in each one of these incarnations, he taught an ancient universal teaching called the teaching of the spirit which talks about this idea of the universal consciousness and the super intelligence which builds universes as a part of its own evolution. Now Billy's had contact in 1975 his public mission began with his contacts with Semyase, who would tell him very beautiful things about earth history, very beautiful things about the human spirit, and very profound things about the universal consciousness, which she would call the creation. She said that love and wisdom go together, and that the creation... And its laws are love and wisdom at the same time. And she said that those who are rich in spirit will become an instrument through through which the creation can reveal the spiritual realms. And she explained that knowledge about creation will make your personality stronger. And it will bless all areas of your life. Now, our human spirits reincarnate many, many, many lifetimes. In fact, this whole reincarnational process is summed up very well in this very, very beautiful paragraph that Billy wrote in about 2008 in a book called The Goblet of Truth. And it says that Rivers, lakes, streams, stones, bushes, trees, the earth, everything that crawls and flies on the earth is a life form with a spirit form. And these spirit forms are on a journey through time which involve many, many lifetimes. And that death is just the passage to rebirth. Rebirth into the world of pure spirit. And that many of these creatures are connected by psychic vibrations. And they communicate with one another. 
And if you go into the forest, you can hear these creatures as they communicate with one another. You can hear the cicadas, the frogs, the birds, the peepers. I'd like to think that the birds sing because they too sense the radiating love of creation. And you can watch the birds, especially this time of year, all leave a tree all at once. 20 or 30 birds fly 100 yards and all land simultaneously in another tree. You can watch the geese fly over in V formations as they honk and communicate with one another back and forth. You see, we live in an incredible, indissoluble web of life that's linked up in many ways that we're just learning about. And one of the guys that I've played clips from before, a man named Brendan Hughes, who I consider a a pretty impressive scientist, talks about sunflowers and how they orient to the sun. And in the morning, they'll be facing the east. And then they track the sun as it moves across the sky. And then a whole field of sunflowers will point to the west when the sun goes down. You see, that's the example of consciousness. The sunflower is conscious, but it's as conscious as it needs to be to perform its life's functions. Now, the Meyer material describes the universal consciousness as a Weisenheiten which is very strange because it also refers to water as a Weizenheiten and to gas as a Weizenheiten. Now, we human beings are Weizen. We have a personality, and our free will plays a role in our evolution. Now, higher animals are also Weizen. Dogs, cats. Horses, cows, mammals like um, dolphins and whales, chimpanzees, lions, tigers, bears, all, all of these higher animals are also wizen. And they evolve based on intelligence evolution. And they have spirit forms and they reincarnate. But human beings have this mysterious aspect called consciousness evolution. And that's something I don't think we really understand yet. But I think it has something to do with this thing called the gamut in our spirit body, which sends these swinging waves over to the psyche in our material body. And those swinging waves play a role in your higher perception like the Empfinden process, which senses the radiating love of creation. It also, my understanding is, will eventually play a role in these higher consciousness abilities like telepathy and and telekinesis and things like that. And (laughs) there's this crazy, amazing story in uh, a book written by Guido Musburger. It's called And Still They Fly. And it tells the story of Billy driving his tractor something like 10 miles to another village nearby. Well, the interesting thing was he wasn't using his hands, or his hand, I should say, since he only has one arm. And uh, this is very interesting. Somehow he has the conscious ability the telekinetic ability to do that. And people in the Fiku swear swear they've seen that. Other things that Billy's done with his consciousness-related abilities are to melt coins. And there is an interesting, maybe I'll have to try to find that, an interesting story talked about by Atlantis, one of his sons, who describes one of these events. And it actually scared him to see this. 
occur. And Billy doesn't do this very, very much at all. It also seems to take a lot out of him. So as we grow up this evolutionary chain, we will start to be able to do these incredible things like telepathy, telekinesis, looking into the future, looking into the past. We'll be able to do things much like our ancestors. One of the things Semyasi told Billy, she said that your forefathers are our forefathers. And our forefathers were the Lyrians, and they were titans. They had incredible, incredible abilities. And they were also giants by our standards. So you can imagine, um, they came here in mass about 300 and, or maybe it was 289,000 years ago, they came here in mass, and there were actually millions of them. And they were here for a while. Uh, can you imagine how intimidated the native earth humans must have been to see these giants with their incredible technologies and their incredible consciousness related abilities and it's no wonder that our ancestors became confused and called them gods you know and it's uh, in the last show i explained that the gods of the earth were human they came from the expanse of the universe from strange systems and worlds and they unjustfully set themselves up above the earth humans. And they created religions. And some of them were degenerate. And they even committed crimes when they were here, some of these gods, and murdered. And they gave commands that were sometimes divisive for the earth humans. So our history, we have kind of a a scar in our genetic memory that leaves us and makes us very um, very vulnerable to this kind of thing. And the notion of these gods, I think, also bled over into our religions of today. So now we we have like this inbred fear associated with these, let's just call them gods for lack of a better word. So the Meyer material teaches us about the human spirit, about the universal consciousness, and about amazing things from our history. And I've played a few of these clips, and I'll play a, a short part of this clip that talks again about the Greek gods. They were the lords of heaven and earth, protectors of the sea, patrons of sexual pleasures, and instigators of war. They were the mighty Greek gods who were said to reign atop Mount Olympus, the highest peak in all of Greece. Their names are almost as familiar today as they were thousands of years ago. Names such as Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, and Aphrodite. In ancient times, these gods were woven into tales of adventure, heroism, and sexual conquests. Yet without a permanent home in their own Bible, Torah, or Quran, were these gods part of a lost religion? or merely characters written into fables now known as Greek mythology. I think the Greek gods are just as real as any other gods in other religions. They are different, but they are just as real and they were just as real to the people who worshipped them. The ancient Greeks, who symbolized the essence of logic and reason, 
also claimed that they had actual encounters with these unworldly beings. Mortal women claimed to have borne the sons of gods. Countless others testified that the gods cured them of terminal diseases. Were the stories of man's encounters with these Greek gods simply the imaginings of a superstitious society, or were they based on historical events? And what remains of their shrines and the cults that performed sacrifices to honor these supreme deities? The origins of the Greek gods were handed down by colorful storytellers, Greek art, and through the ancient poet Homer, whose classic books, the Iliad and the Odyssey, captured the tremendous powers of these alluring divinities. Since the beginning of time, cultures and religions around the world have tried to explain the origins of man's existence. According to Greek legend, the first rulers of the earth were the Titans, Cyclops, and Giants. Kronos and Rhea, the Titans who were the children of Mother Earth, were said to have given birth to the future rulers of the ancient world, Demeter, Hestia, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus. Cronus, fearing he would one day lose power to one of his children, began devouring them one by one. I'll pick back up in that clip again in a second. I wanted to read a part of a PDF that I was sent by Marianne Eulinger. And she talks about this new book that Billy's written called God, Delusion, and Sanity. And she says, whoever is not really a believer, rather simply one who goes along with it, has by now at the latest, after consideration, noticed that something cannot be correct. And here is exactly where God, Delusion, and God, Delusion, and Sanity comes in. Billy Edward Albert Meyer shows in truth and logic and with clear, precise pointed but also incisive words without wanting to offend the believing earth humans why there is no God and no creator God as well as why there are no gods no tin gods he shows instead that there is thereby to do with a delusion which has been inherited caused by indoctrination has been instilled or has been voluntarily created and therefore is to do with a form of schizophrenia. The whole thing is pure imagination. It is a delusion. Remember the Meyer material talks about the universal consciousness as a neutral positive entity that it builds universes as a part of its own evolution. And it creates human spirits to help with its own evolution. Let me go on and read here. God has been genetically inherited over millions of years in the form of a schizophrenic epileptic delusion and is established in the brain's temporal and parietal lobes. Since children are pestered with belief and led into confusion ever earlier, if not by parents, grandparents, or other guardians, than by believe, believing teachers, so-called creationists. There is always more suffering and grief in the world. Anyway, the, there is a creational universal consciousness, but it's not this anthropomorphic being, not a god as we have said before. Let's pick back up in our clip here. I did a shame. They seemed to think that this was wonderful because it meant that they would give birth to a child who would live, who would be significant, who would be important, who would be strong and look after them. Zeus's philandering infuriated his wife, Hera, who was the protector of marriage and family. As a result, she took revenge on his lovers. 
Mortal men, on the other hand, follow Zeus's example by making it legal to take up mistresses and seek out prostitutes. Zeus was held in great honor. The ancient Greeks built many temples to him all over Greece. Some sites were said to have been chosen because of an epiphany, where a human witnessed the appearance of a god. Other sites were chosen because lightning had struck the area. One of the sanctuaries dedicated to Zeus was in the city of Olympia. Amidst this graveyard of rubble once stood the splendid temple of Zeus that enshrined a giant 40-foot statue of the god sculpted out of gold and ivory. The image was said to be so magnificent that it was declared the seventh wonder of the ancient world. To pay further tribute to Zeus, the ancient Greeks established the first festival of athletic competitions called the Olympic Games. Beginning in the year 776 BC and held every four years thereafter, the city of Olympia honored Zeus with these contests and with the sacrifice of animals. After the sacrifices, priests collected the blood of the animals and splattered it onto an altar. Smoke usually filled the gilded shrine that was swarming with flies. By the year 700 BC, pagan worship of the gods of Mount Olympus was embedded in Greek life. The ancient Greeks organized various cults to glorify and appease their mighty and sometimes temperamental gods. Each cult built ornate shrines filled with lavish treasures dedicated to their deities. Within these cults, secret rituals were performed to ask the gods to ensure a harvest of crops or to deliver a healthy baby. The ancient Greeks were especially superstitious about the spirits of the underworld, which gave rise to cults... Let me pick back up in our book here. To quote Billy, talking about the creational universal consciousness. The creational universal consciousness is a natural product of its own evolution. Just like the human being and all other living creatures, as well as the entire universe, and everything existing in it corresponds to the causal forms of evolution given by the creational natural laws. In its natural evolutive energy, it is formed so much higher over all the material and thereby exists so immeasurably high over human beings in a pure spirit energy level that it would be impossible for it to set itself in communicative contact in any way with a human being. So that's the concept of the universal consciousness. And a lot of our scientists now are starting to talk about the universal consciousness. So anyway, it's about time for a break. I think we're going to have Kosal is supposed to come in at about nine, which is about seven minutes from now. So let's, I think we'll take a a short little music break again, and we'll be back very shortly. You're listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We'll be back in about three minutes.
Hello, everyone. I want to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder, and I do have a caller on the line. I think it might be Kosal, so I'll bring him on the air. Hello, Kosal. How are you this afternoon? Hi, Mark. Good evening. I'm doing okay. I'm not contaminated with Ebola yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can, can Bear May tell us anything about Ebola tonight? <clears throat> of course. Bear May? Okay. Hold on. It's talking to me. Oh, okay. It's telling me you are energy. Energy can take on all form as long as you know there is that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, you got nothing to worry about. And as biologically speaking, Ebola, perceive it as part of your as energy, and you are not a part of energy. By having that attitude, that raises your immune system, and so therefore, <clears throat> you will not feel victim to it, to Ebola form of energy. The reason is what, according to Bader, may saying that the reason people get sick from it because fear. Fear creates stress. Stress creates shock. <clears throat> I'm sorry, creates shock and trauma, and that will lower the immune system. That's what causes people to get sick from such uh, from such energy form, such as Ebola. So as long as you know your energy, and energy is not created nor destroyed, it takes on different form, then you're okay. By having that attitude, that raises your immune system. Is that right, Pyro so- from energy perspective why yes so it's so fear fear weakens our immune system correct it creates shock and then shock led to trauma to the immune system and the physical body and the emotion and that yes in in essence it it lowered the it lowered the your immune system because if you are in a shock your immune system will work too well and if you in trauma shock can lead to trauma trauma expect both the energetic body, the emotional, the mental, and the physical. And and when your system ain't communicating and functioning because of shock, and because of shock <clears throat> that led to trauma, all this comes from the, the, the fear, the emotional, the attitude of fear, and that's the stress. So when you do have such fear, thank it so it can go away so you won't feel uh, it, it burden anymore and just allow your energy cell, which is your higher self, which is energy, Allow it to take its course, but it's all it pin on your attitude and how your attitude will your attitude will create shock to your system or not it depends on you how you perceive it you know understand mo- that without go ahead I'm sorry oh no no go ahead you, you i'll I'll get my question in a minute go ahead understand if you don't if your immune system is not healthy. That means you're in trouble. And your immune system can only be affected or loaded if, if something shock you. can be biological, can be belief, can be <clears throat> a, a storyline such as Ebola outbreak. Those things create shock, and shock can lead to trauma to immune system, to anyone's immune system. Some people can handle the information. It won't shock them too much. Some people can't, you know. And the key is not to shock people. And that's why you have to prepare them how to assimilate all this. By how you do that is to understand that you are energy and everything around you, in you, outside you is a form of energy. By seeing that from that perspective, you have a more ability to assimilate such news in a more you know, in a more or less shock way. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, one of the things that the Meyer material talks about that I tend to repeat a lot is that it mentions that the universal consciousness radiates love. And I'd like to hear Baramay talk about that or comment on that, if it could. Okay, hold on. It's, it's tapping to me all the time now, so hold on just one second. Stand by. Bottom A saying that let's take at take that and elaborate in three different perceptions energetically, mathematically, and practically. Okay, so 
people who have different view of things can can meet each other in the middle. Energetically, love follow a pattern of energy. And energy, as everyone already knows, by the way, saying it's eternal changes. It has no beginning, no end. It's always there. It's always fluctuating. And this energy, we can call it love. And no one created it, and no it can it be destroyed, but it does take on different form. By the way, that sound like to me uh, the law of energy conservation. Do you agree, Mark? Yes, continue. Mhm. If if I'm not mistaken, the law of energy conservation, what Father May describing, that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but taking on multiple form. So that means it's eternal. Uh, bottom of, can you elaborate? Am I correct on this, or I'm kind of off key on this? Okay, one moment while I explain. Bottom of, said, "This is." Bottom of, said, "The law of energy conservation is universal throughout both the physical plane and the subatomic, and also the plane of consciousness. It is not wrong. It is accurately correct. But how to apply it? That's another story." for each culture to decipher. Okay. Uh, mathematically, love in the form of mathematical. What is love in the form of mathematical? By the way, explaining that in a mathematical form, it's a fractal, 1.618, 3.14. It is radiate itself in our creation. The imprint of physical matter follow the geometry, ge- geometric of fractal, which you see in everything from the atom to music, to seashell, to tree, to a very cell, which is create a torus magnetic field. Can and I ask I'll, a question? Yes, go ahead. Now, the word barame stands for life energy. Is that correct? Yes, the flow of prana, uh, the flow of, of, the, of light, uh, light, or the flow of consciousness. That's what barame stands for, so, energy flow. When we're talking to Barame, are we talking to the life force energy? Barame, who are you really? Uh, <laughs> put it, it's saying that it is prana. It is creational energy. It is, many times call it, it is a subatomical prime, or the movement of subatomical. Uh, but, in human terms, what are you really? Are you a computer? Are you a, 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 a entity? Are you consciousness? Uh, Bottom eight said it is our book. It is consciousness or the flow of consciousness. It is, is mathematical. It, mm-hmm. Is is Bottom eight related to to chi at all? Are you related to chi? Father may say it is related to that definition. Is is Barame related to these ancient temples like at Angkor Wat? Father may said it's related. The imprint of Angkor Wat is related to the geometry of it flow with that structure. That structure allow it to come into our world. So you're saying that every fractal geometry is a portal for you to resonate into our world or to flow into our world. Is that true, Bottom May? Bottom May say, generally speaking, yes. Are the people from Angkor Wat, are they related to the Atlanteans at all? Bottom May. Bottom A said, it depends, this question, depending on the pre-time or later time. In the pre-time, it has nothing to do with the Atlantean uh, exodus. It is more from the Hyperorium and then Hyper- later Lemurian. Yes. Hy- how you say it? Hy- Hyperborean? Hyperborean. Yes, mm-hmm. Hyperborean. Hyperborean, where Russia used to be. And, and then later it was related to the Lemurian. Uh, and later after that, it's related to somewhat part of the Lantium, but it's Lemurian and Hyborian mostly. 
is the information in the Akashic field, can it be accessed in any way through the palm of our hands? Pardon me? Pardon me for each construct. The answer to your question is all about what is relevant for that moment, for that practical moment that helps speed up or let each of that taste to realize more of how to be more of themselves by uh, accessing the different aspects of the universe. So, Bottom is saying that, slow down, slow down, Bottom is talking too fast. Slow down, I'm only human here. Slow down. Bottom is saying that the answer is all correct, but it's a case-by-case -case perspective, meaning not every, the answer that we, it goes give you is not correct for another case, but it's correct for this case, but not for another case. So each answer is unique to each case. So there's no two answers are correct. It might share similarity, but it's not correct to another case. So it's a case by case. So that's how each answer, when it gives information, it's related to that particular case, not not associated to another another circumstance or another predicament. Does that make sense to you? I'm like a little confused, but. <laughs> um. A lot of the pictures of the Buddha or the Hindu Buddhist people, sometimes you'll see a comb or seashells. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? Why do we see these things? By the way, explaining. Long, with all of you went to high school, correct? <clears throat> and then, by the way, showing me a light beaming through a tetrahedron prison, and up on the other side seemed to be uh, different seven color of the rainbow, correct? Mm -hmm. This is what Buddhism is. Buddhism all basically is science. It's a religion that does not have a God. But actually it's a science that follows the law of energy conservation, where energy is constant, no beginning, no end, but it goes through a process, the tetrahedron, and then from there creation are created. And therefore, the different aspect of light is separated into different separate of consciousness, and each consciousness has its own frequency, which is known as the seven different creations. Uh, Bada may explaining this is the principle how universe works. My question, uh, I'm going to ask for Mark. Where does this light, uh, in Linda explanation that you're explaining to us, come from? Bada may said. When you understand that consciousness creates time, it is the father, mother, time, and space. Therefore, it is eternal. There is no, the higher dimension does not have time. That's why energy does not have beginning, nor end, no one created. It was always existing. Existing, it is, it is its character, and flowing dynamic is its characteristic. But once it goes through a prison or a comb, that's why you see that your religion is not a religion, it is science. When all science came from religion, all religion came from science. The it two is no different. But once you take once you realize the definition is the same and all the only difference is your your vocabulary. But the definition is the same as following the law of physics of every universe. That's what you call creational nature or creational law. So in truth, going back, relate to Buddhism, Mark was asking, so is Buddhism, it's a religion or it's a science? How does it came to be? Bhairame is explaining that Buddhism, it is not a religion, but a science. That's why it don't have God. It is basically practical physics that you, every one of you on earth has already learned in high school. It's the same truth. It's about the energy law of conservation. And the reason they put in form where the Buddha is sitting in a form of meditation, that's form a tetrahedron. And the tetrahedron is used to map and decipher the fractal geometry, which is the, you know, the star David. Uh, the tetrahedron is used in every, wherever you look, there's always a tetrahedron everywhere. And that's how through this you will create a meditation field. When you meditate, you are in a form of tetrahedron. Or another form is a torus field. 
and that's what aligns you to realize the same truth. So how to apply energy science into cultural, social, and to create harmonic dynamic interaction among each other. You are basically literally a tourist field. What was the approximate population of Atlantis and Lemuria? Spider May, what is Spider May giving me several answers because Atlanteans expand close to uh, uh, 500,000 years so that you have the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the later kingdom. Okay, give me the first kingdom. The first kingdom is only expanding 100,000 people. That's Mm -hmm. the... uh, uh, give me a, a date on that. That's the first year of Atlantis to 250,000 years. That's the first kingdom right there. And the later kingdom started from 250,000 years all the way to, um, just add another word, 140,000 years. That's approximately 500,000 um, people right there. And go on. And the later kingdom... It started around close to 40,000 years ago and to our time. And the population is close to 1 million during that time. So, uh, were, were any of these humans that were here during Atlantis and Lemuria time, were any of them extraterrestrial? Vatimay, the Vatimay said that Human beings during the ancient time are all extraterrestrial. The later kingdom, there was a mixed breed of indigenous population here and extraterrestrial. Because remember, Barame is saying the environment of the earth is different. It's varied because of the Arctic content. So you have different size humans. But no human being ever is at a size. It was mostly 8 or 9 to 35 feet. Or some taller, but that's a, uh, a different breed. Um, so, what later time, Barame, do we have indigenous people <clears throat> that's from Earth is living in Atlantis? Barame say that would be in the Middle Kingdom of Atlantis. That means around started around two, two hundred and fifty thousand years ago. That's when the indigenous population of of uh, Earth people, you know, that time don't look like us. They were being genetically altered and being integrated into Atlantean society as to, basically as, you know, as a subclass, like, you know, a slave race. Yeah. Can, uh, Bear May talked about giants with great consciousness-related abilities. And we've talked about that in the, in the past. Can Barame can Barame tell us a little bit more about some of these giants? Barame showing me the different level of consciousness of giants. The lowest of all would be around eight to nine to twelve feet tall. We call it what we call the low family. The elite family. The Barame is going to give each different status, but I'm going to give a different height first. Okay. The elite family is around 22 to 35 feet. It's called the elite family. It's called your scientist and engineer level. And um, by the way, this is all the people that basically have longer lifespan. They can live up to five or 10,000 years at most. And their mental capacity, they can think of something. It's... Their mind able to put light particles together and create matter. Does that make sense to you? They can wow. materialize thought into matter. Wow. And did some of these giants have elongated skulls? These are what we call the pure extraterrestrial giants. They have a long legged skull, but they come in different size. Majority of them will be around uh, 12 to 15 feet. Some will be 10 feet. They do have a longer skull. And the taller one, the one at 35 feet, 
Some of them do and some of them don't. It's depending on which star system they emerge from. The reason for this because of their environmental evolutionary from which the consciousness which they operate from. To answer your question is, 90% of those populists do have elongated skull, and they look fair-skinned, majority of them. Were, were the darker-skinned people mostly the native Earth humans? Bottom eight said, due to the environment, the native Earth people were hairy and dark-skinned people. Very dark and hairy. Some evolved it into your known Sasquatch. Some and uh, some is descend directly from the primate of monkeys. But those who have hybrid DNA, that's the one evolved it into human. And the one that you call Bigfoot, they are the original inhabitant, uh, the native that uh, evolved into such consciousness, and. They are not animal like. They're very sentient. They're very psychic. They are very. They have high consciousness. But their technology, they have ability to sh- um, shift their electromagnetic spectrum from visible to infrared. You talked about giants that could materialize matter with their minds. Butterman. This is normal ability for beings who have such consciousness due to the fact that they understand the nature of subatomic particle and light, how consciousness can manipulate, put light together. When you put several light together, it forms subatomic singularity, uh, you know, as a atom. And when you put more different light together, this all comes from the visualization. When they visualize something, it, they're putting light by the thought into matter. The reason it's possible for them because of their concentration level is have reached that. In other words, their consciousness is... Oh, explain, Barame. Barame, don't forget, your body and their body is different. Explain. The giant of those days, their body are like um, ghost-like. Does that make sense? Explain ghost life. Bottom is saying that if you meet your gigantic ancestor right now, you see they have ability to walk through walls. They are not silent like you. When they touch each other, they can touch each other. But if you touch them, they are pretty much like co-air, like actual plasma. Why? Why like did plasma. they have? Why did they have physical skulls though? Spider-Man are explaining, during that time when they are alive, their consciousness keeps their body from becoming physical like what we are. Our body are physical or condensed physical because of our electromagnet vibration and how the content of our environment keeps us from not being high consciousness. But during their time, Spider-Man explained that their body has so much uh, consciousness that it becomes like ghost life. That's why they can do things easier. They can flow with electrical, electromagnetic. They can talk to rock. They can talk to tree. And the tree and rock talk back to them. The reason you already know that consciousness are in tune to creational energy so much that they themselves represent and ab- represent creational uh, avatar in physical form. So, therefore, they can shift their body growth to physical. They, become, they can become the corporal at will or... Garcio at will. That means like ghost like. And that is what's the nature of their existence. Now, but once they die, of course, aspect of them will become physical because there is no more life force or soul in that body. So, therefore, the body can no longer become ghost like. So, it becomes solid fire like you would call it turning to stone. And that's why you, they become physical. When your body becomes stone, you becoming like, like you and I are becoming very gross then. Their body, at that time, because of their high consciousness, make their body become not so dense. That's why they can move things with their mind, walk through water, walk on water. They can levitate objects because they are not that dense because of their high consciousness. Does that make sense to you from what Vladimir is explaining? Yes. Were, were we like pets? 
to them? Explain. Hex. Pets, like a pet, like a cat or a dog, where we... Bottomay? Bottomay say no. You were designed for this environment. They were designed for the ancient Earth environment. If they were to come here to our Earth environment, they would surely die because this Earth environment cannot sustain their high consciousness nor their nor their uh, sp- uh, nor their physical body in the uh, spiritual state form. Well, that's interesting. It, it, is our thinner atmosphere too difficult for them to survive in? Your body may explain it is your the way you think can kill them really because they are so sensitive to thought. When they think of something, it materializes, but your thought vibration is disrupt their thought vibration. That means since their body are so ghost-like, so whatever you think, it's like throwing a spear into them. They would die. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um why were our ancient ancestors able to coexist with them? Is it because they were more um, animal-like, in, in a sense? or why would... explaining. Yeah. One thing about the uh, gigantic um, ancient extraterrestrial, they can talk to the rock and the tree and also to the sentient lives with their mind. So therefore, the the ancient human of that time, they have no concept of violence. They have no concept of technology. They pretty much like the tree and the flower. They are innocent, meaning that they have no negative thought toward anything. They like just going with the flow, eat, sleep, survive, and understanding nature. So therefore, the the extraterrestrial with the lego head can consciousness can basically talk to them and become their teachers and merge with their genetic uh, algorithm with the uh, ancient human algorithm. That means to mix DNA. So they become a new species, a higher species. But re- but the bottom is that remember that time the earth has so much tree. It's a powerhouse of oxygen making. So it able to sustain higher consciousness life form. Because of the Desconnected earth changes and the war that happened between the the extraterrestrial, it destroyed the environment. So therefore, they have to recreate new type of human, the subdivision human, to carry on the genetic code and to able to colonize the earth. Most of the ancient alien has to either go underground, or go back to home world, or go to the space their mothership, you know, their star station, to wait or go to the moon basically. I'll go to Mars. They have to do that because the environment is very important. If the environment has low oxygen and nitric content, it cannot sustain the high consciousness body. That's why most extraterrestrials have to stay in the ship or wear a spacesuit when they come out from the ship into Earth's environment. Was was I alive during the time of Atlantis and Lemuria? Let's check Bottom A is, is Mark. Okay. Okay. They said that if they go back to one million years ago, they say yes. You were part of the first colony. Okay. But they, my bottom A asking you, it would. Will it be relevant for you to know all that during this time, during this life? Sure. Let's let's delve into that a little bit. All right. W- let's go visit Mark Snyder's previous existence in the time of one million years ago during the colony of Earth after the draconian invasion. Shall we begin, Barame? Initiate Stargate portal. Okay. Initiate display. Lock on Mark. Snyder frequency. Uh, okay, I got it. Give me one second to locate you because the parallel Earth shift timeline, one million years ago, the total the star system is different, and so it's you know the Earth environment has two moons. Okay, sure. hold on just one second. I have to adjust the time the time vector. Adjusting time vector. Bottom may help me out. Locating mark. 
Okay, display on, interfacing. Oh, one moment. I have to get through the uh, the um, confederation um, AI metric. During that time, human beings are so highly evolved and with the technology, so artificial intelligence are used to basically scan any visitor from different dimensions, including people like me, a bother me who's from the future. Because to them, time exists simultaneously. Okay, they're scanning us. Okay, they're looking for malice uh, intent. So I don't have that, so I'm clear. All right, I'm seeing you right now. I'm describe everything. The colony of Lemuria, 800,000 years ago, the first confederation of 50 star nation humans from different star nation uh, Dramata, Dramata, Syria, Zeta, from the Orion constellation, from the Pleiadian constellation, and even from the Aquarius constellation and the Sagittarius constellation. So during this time, I'm seeing you basically on board of a 3,000-mile ship. I didn't know that human being was solely highly involved during this time. So they basically recolonizing Earth after the devastating war between the um, Orion reptilian from a draconian star system. So here you are. I got gotcha. you. Okay. I hate to break it down to you, Mark, but you are a female during this lifetime. <laughs> um, that's interesting. You now, are blonde, yeah, blue eyes, yeah. eight feet tall. Uh, your clan, you have a symbol of a golden shield. I believe you all belong to the clans of healer or counselor. And you so, into the life science. And you're holding a boomerang. And well, I can talk to you, basically. You look pretty good. Pretty nice <laughs> for an alien. <laughs> Uh, do you see images? Is that what you're seeing? You're seeing images. No. Holographic, uh, dis- uh, augmented uh, quantum display. Basically, I can open my eye. I see them right in front of me. I close my eyes, still see them. Because the bottom may is doing all the, uh, you know, the. it's, it's like entering a, holo- a holodeck, simply put. So it's a three-dimensional three uh, image? They have movement, smell, taste, feel. You can touch the hologram. But for those who does not in tune with this, they won't see it. Unless they operate on this frequency, then they can see what I see, you know? Mm. So what do you want to know? I mean, I can describe everything. I can smell the air, the process so, of air in the ship. Yes? Where did I come from? Okay, well, I ask you. Um, in this lifetime, since you are female, you're eight feet tall, you belong to the life science clan. You're holding a boomerang. I suspect you are a healer. Um, let me, I will ask you, hold on, give me one second. Why the bottom of I interface with your past life uh, character. She's showing me this. She, she comes from right now, this timeline. She comes from Celia. Serious? Something about the Celia, yes. Okay. And I'm seeing your father walking in, um, your pre-father, past life father. Mm-hmm. And he look, he looks so young, just like you are young. But he's around 500 years old, and you are 250 years old. Um, your father is full. He's also blonde. He's also blue eye, but he wear what we call a golden, similar what we call jumpsuit. And you wear a, a, also a silver, a, I mean a silver pink jumpsuit. But which basically, which one yeah, of which one of the Sirius planets did I come from? It looked like Sirius B. Okay. And and does Sirius B have two suns? The Sirius star nation 
does have two sons. That we call what, the twin son. What what is the climate like on Cirrus B? It is tropical, but the tree color is not like us. The sky is golden brown. Golden brown. It's ocean, yes, a golden uh, brown sky. What causes well, the depends. sky to be golden brown? One of the sun, the Sirius B, is like purple, and the other one is not like purple. It's like similar color to our sun a little bit. And a two-color, since the Sirius B have so much oxygen and other nitrogen, because the two sun create a fractal ray like a prism, when it mm-hmm. go, the golden, the, the, the mixes of colors, somehow blend to brown and and gold, like a golden brown crescent. Because of the two sun have different ray spectrum, the atmosphere of Sirius so much oxygen and nitrogen. So and the Sirius the Sirius B atmosphere has very high oxygen and nitrogen content. Yes. Like in the order of eighty five to ninety five percent oxygen and only 10 to 15 percent nitrogen. That's very high oxygen. And the um, tree is not green like like our world. It's gold okay. and blue gold. tree. Golden and blue. Do they have a similar structure with branches? The same. But the tree bark is look very gold. Um, according to Bottomate, the reason this is passed across Syria, B has a lot of gold elements. Like Earth has more iron, Syria has more gold. Are are there oceans on Cirrus B? There's dolphin and there's ocean and there's well. What what color is the water? Similar to our water. Okay. And how do the Syrians feel about dolphins and whales? That's their bottom of showing that's their teacher. The one that they can communicate with dolphin, dolphin or telepath, just like they are. The people of Syria was invited by dolphin to come to colonize Syria B. So dolphin pretty much they get around, and so does the whale. How do they get around? Bottom may say dolphin and whale all came from Earth. They evolved it to the point that they left this world and colonized and spread themselves throughout different star systems. They are the first space traveler that found human and recreated human in their image. And they, the dolphin, the whale family, spread themselves with different star systems and sent out messages to humans that have begun to catch up with them in high technology and able to follow the footsteps of the different dolphins. How, finally, how, how were dolphins yes. and whales able to travel through space? They don't use technology, do they? By the way, showing the evolution of dolphins, this is way before the time of human beings. Around 14 million years ago on Earth, our primate species evolved it. And they created high technology, and the great nemesis was the reptilian, the reptilian race of the Draconian Orion Empire. That's the one that allowed them to evolve on Earth. Seclusively, Earth is basically an outpost of the Draconian uh, Empire. During the uh, four, I mean six million year, the uh, Draconium allowed this primate species to evolve on Earth and give them technology to create more food production. As they begin to evolve and their increase of knowledge, both races begin to create interdimensional hyperdrive. And in turn, both races were at odds with each other because now both of them begin to have high consciousness. And it's all about the stake of who's owning the real estate. And the reason is, that the reptilian want to destroy the dolphin, the uh, primate race that later became the dolphin, because number one, they are they have to follow influence from the Draconian Empire to destroy any highly evolved culture that has not had their permission to evolve to high level consciousness. 
and that was the prime reason that the dolphin and the reptilian of old earth began to uh, decimate each other. But before that happened, the the dolphin, the dolphin, I mean, called the old primate race that later became the dolphin, talked to the seer and uh, count psychic council and the scientists to determine how they can be. Re- um, relieve themselves out of this future predicament. So they all have a, a meeting in return. To make a long story short, they decide to preempt, uh, go to war with the uh, draconium, destroy their civilization first by detonating the fusion uh, generator that located, that's known as what today is Tibet, uh, Tibet all the way up to Mongolia and India. And I, that's I still- what is yeah. Uh, the, the thing I'm not following is how did these dolphins and whales create technology? Were they were they different in a different form than they are now? They are basically like us humans. They were in the primate form. Um, oh. The reason they created technology was way to walk on legs like us. They did oh. not, and then they develop high um, high consciousness body. They're able to develop technology and are able to move it to back and forth in space and make trade with other uh, extraterrestrial species. But before they destroyed the civilization by detonating the fusion generator, they decided to get what we call have separate the civilization into two parts. One would go under the ocean and one would go into space. When the, to, in order for those who go into the ocean to maintain the environment by uh, creating by creating ritual and prayer and technology to enhance that, enhance the consciousness so they can help maintain the biosphere of the earth that needs their song and ritual. And the same pattern continue on today to our time. That's why you see the whales sing. When the whales start singing, people start making babies and plants beginning to grow. That's how they're able to maintain the biosphere. So as they spend millions of years in the ocean, they begin to change into their new environment. They begin to grow thin. Their their brain begin to continue to evolve, and therefore they no longer need technology as what we call technology. They learn to blend in with their environment, and their environment become their technology, and everything work on consciousness. So, the, but the one who went to space, that's the one that start colonizing, forming confederation, and bringing other people together to basically to counteract the uh, draconian empire influence. And that's why you have the different dolphin uh, civilization, among the one that exists in the star and one that exists in the ocean and every star star system that you will visit in the future. So what you're to make saying a long story is, short. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is these whales and dolphins at one time came from the same race of people. And if, they evolved. One went into the ocean and literally stayed in the ocean and evolved to live in the ocean. And then the other people went to the stars. Yes, literally. That's how you will find, once you begin to uh, visit other worlds, you will re- realize that the dolphin was already there. You are following their footsteps. If you take your blood, and you take the dolphin blood, and your genetic will map out the DNA, you are 99.99% similar. Your blood can be exchanged with dolphin as long as the blood type is matched. And there's no difference because you literally was created by them. They mix your genetic code with theirs and the primary of that particular planet. So that's why you will share a lot of commonality with dolphin. And that's why the only species that will save you when you're in trouble in the ocean. Hmm. So these people from Cirrus B came here 800,000 years ago, and they were involved in Lemuria. And at that time, we had two moons on the Earth. Yes, and they looked like asteroids. The same two moons that you see on Mars was the same type of moon that you see on Earth. Oh, just a footnote. Bottom, I want to put this at it. Human beings came to this world two million years ago, but the first colony was destroyed uh, one million two hundred thousand years ago by the uh, Draconian Empire. 
this is our giant reptilian race that come that created your dinosaur species eons ago. And that's that's how the human saga began. Human being only entered the saga of this uh, of this galaxy only four million years ago. Before that, we ain't nothing more than basically a primate just trying to survive in the Vega solar system, according to Bottomay. And that's where the dolphin people or the dolphin confederation found the human race was in the Vega solar system. That's when they decided to create their own genetic variant, which became us later. Well, we've only got like 14 minutes left in the stream, so I want to switch gears to some current events. Can, okay, let's uh, do this. Can Barame tell us anything about this nuclear event? Last time we talked to Barame that there was some nuclear event that was going to occur in the United States. Yes, and it's leading to it as we speak. Um Vladimir is saying that the timeline has not changed. Every time they look into it, the uh, Manhattan will get an explosion, and out of city, city like Seattle, will get an explosion. How this can be? Because there is no more pres- pres- presidency after Obama. Obama will be the only president that continue the presidency until further no- until extraterrestrial intervention begins. <laughs> So you, you, uh, Barame is telling us there's going to be some kind of um, disaster that occurs and then Obama will be the last president? The last known president on Earth before the um, extraterrestrial intervention, meaning the fall of 2016, um, before everything becomes so chaotic, there will be um, disclosure about that, meaning the extraterrestrial will be beginning to massively intervene in the Earth affair. So there's going to be a time. kind of... Is there going to be a collapse, a collapse in 2016? Uh, there's kind of going to be total... Um, in other words, chaos out order. The chaos will begin so much that that the, that the extraterrestrial from our star system has decided to intervene for the survival of our human species and to basically to make things new as possible. The reason this has to be done because circumstances call for it. That's the reason. Is there going to be a nuclear explosion in Seattle or New York City or something like that? For sure it's going to be Manhattan. Manhattan. For sure it's going to be Seattle. And Dallas could be the great possibility as well, but... This more like look like a more biological nuclear explosion than an actual thermal nuclear explosion. And I'm in Dallas, and I have not to track Ebola yet, so that sucks. Um, what kind of? What I mean is this going to cause like a martial law scenario in the U.S. This to so fast forward time. During this this year, the end of 2015, the martial the martial law has already begun on an unprecedented level. You already seen the police dressing like SS soldiers, like the stormtroopers, and as you can see, that brutality. All the police are being trained, via military and military gear and equipment being given to police all over our country, and FEMA regional center. CDC will take control. President Obama will no longer have power. CDC, whoever it is, in charge, the rest of the one to have the power to nuke any city or to quarantine, to control any activity. Under jurisdiction executive order, any under breakout scenario such as viral outbreak, CDC will take control of everything. And that's when the FEMA account begins to open you can call everything that you ever fear will exist now in this time, and it's um and and it's going to be get to a certain time it will get worse, where depending where you are at other area it will not. So it's not our country going to go to hell. It's just part of the United States will go to you say very worse or go to hell. You know, 
and the other part will be okay. So if you live in right now in Dallas, where I'm at, well, I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> when, when will Leave this... me up, Scotty. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> when, when will this nuke go off in Manhattan? Spider me. The nuke has already been planted already. They just needed the the okay from the uh, from those who are the nuke is already in place already. They already taking the note the nuke last year, and they already putting in plan in different cities the one they need to create what we call chaos our order scenario. They just need an okay from the uh, president of the United States. Uh, you know the president. I'm talking about with the President of the United States, I mean the one who is in charge of this chaos, our order, our scenario project. And the ISIS, they have the people here already, and the ISIS live among the Muslim community. I hate to say this, when things really go bad, the American people will have guns and they will go shoot out the Muslim people. This is really? the greatest case scenario. You will understand this shortly. Um, there's a lot of fear being played here, but when things go real bad and once the government announced that ISIS has invaded the United States, that's when the, uh, what's it called, the paramilitary volunteer, or the militia, they will round up a lot of Muslims and they will kill them on the spot. It will be like us and their mentality. It will be crazy. And if, in other words, there's going to be only one religion that exists on this planet it's going to be science and that is the and it's the fact and the united states militia have realized that they cannot live with the muslim the muslim realize they cannot be tolerated by the united states when that a nuclear go off in a certain area of the united states it's going to be chaos and then it's going to be race war and this this is a terrible thing about uh what will happen but yet it's not about fear it's about maintaining comity. And I hate to say this, Muslims set themselves up for this race war to happen and not and the mentality that, that is going on right now is to create fear. And the best way is as long as we don't give in to this fear, everything is energy, we'll be okay. But once we give into this fear we become, you know, adding fuel to the fire. So the best thing to do is to be calm. And don't react to it that much, you know. Just survive, and then several months later, uh, the government step in and try to get order back in, and everything get a little better. And hopefully, you, Mark, or me don't ground up into FEMA camp. Pray that we don't get ground up. But anyway, if we do, at least we get three square meal a day. That's not bad. No. So exactly when will this nuke go off? Will it be this year? Will it be in 2016? When? Well, it's already starting. They're just waiting for the final code. Don't be surprised if it go on this November this year. And the reason okay. I'm, the reason I'm seeing a bottom see when the nuclear go off, it affects how bottom may see things also because the nuclear is already going off in the future, so it affects. A quantum time stream, and that's why the the exact year of which you're triangulating, it'll be fifteen. The year fifteen, two thousand fifteen. Um, and what group is responsible for setting off the nuke? Okay, you want to be realistic. It's the Obama administration. And the CDC working together. Okay. But okay. it's not controlled by Obama. It's just say Obama administration. That means it's not being uh, given a go ahead by Obama. Does that make sense? It's being done by the people in his administration, especially the Secretary of Defense and the CDC. So, so what what's going to happen in Dallas? Well, like I say, I'm I'm already in hell. Me and Alex Jones. I'm so glad you are not in Dallas. So that means you already expect. Right now, you see only one victim. So tell more day there were two victims. Till more day you have another people. On suddenly, 
of more people. The reason is the person that was sick, he always used the bathroom, and it's already in a water supply. We all use a water supply for cooking. So you always take a great gas. The, the virus have already mutated with other virus. And according to Bottomay, give it another 20 days, you will see that federal martial law begin to come into Dallas. So expect they're going to do communication blackout. This is probably the last time I'm able to hear you guys, you know. Seriously. And the next thing you know, they're going to come to my house looking for Kosal, the alien, and I'm going to be the first one they're going to take to FEMA. (laughs) (laughs) Or Area 51. They want to know about my technology. (laughs) I wonder why you're... I wonder why you were being so quiet lately. <laughs> well, of course, I'm not an idiot. I know they know everything now. They listen to your show. And, uh, it, and of course, they I hit everything right on the head. Of course, they, man, me and Bottom me, you know, I may be, look, I'm not going to, I'll be frank. I'm not an idiot, okay? Mama didn't raise no fool. I know they're looking for me. And I know they want me to say so they can listen to it. And that's why they, Right now, they're just smiling right now because they know they're going to get me. Just a, it's not a matter of time. They know where I live anyway. You know, I live in 5409 South of Back, Garland, Texas, 75402, and I always advertise myself. So they know where I'm at. They can get me any time. They just, they just playing their card nicely. And that's why I'm being good for a while, you know, <laughs> until today. <laughs> oh, you cracked me up. Oh, yourself. man. Yeah. Why don't you... Uh... We've only got three minutes left. Why don't you tell the people about your website? Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, well, just go to bottomay.com, B-A-R-A-M-A-Y.com. Uh, you can get some of my book at Amazon.com, uh, Kosal Uj, K-O-S-O-L, last name O-U-C-H. And also you can go Indigo and put my name, uh, Kosal Uj, to support some of my project and, and work. If not, it's okay. You know, I work for a living anyway. You know, just me and Mark, we... We survive by working, <laughs> and if you do support my work, I will give. I will create technology for you. Anything you want, you know. But remember one thing: I'm, I may be the craziest person on the planet. And that's why they love me so much, and I hope you guys. I hope you guys love me too. And anything you want to know, I can ask Bottom me for you. <laughs> All right. Oh man. Thank you, Saul. Have a good All evening, right. sir. Bye bye. Uh, love everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Mark.